Let's make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And for a few seconds, linger in the presence of our lovely God. Dear God, we love you with all our hearts, but so much less than your boundless love for us, for which we thank you. In the course of our time together, we do not ask you to be with us because you're never absent but we ask that we may be with you. Greater awareness, greater consciousness, and in that awareness and consciousness of living and having our being in you, open our minds and hearts to the mystery you are and to all our sisters and brothers. And all of our prayers are in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. After beginning our time together yesterday morning, using that little sound bite from John Henry Newman, sola cum solo, as the kind of aspiration of our time together and indeed of our lives. Being alone with God, you know, no masks, no pretense, just exactly the way we are um, before the presence of our lovely God. And then having done that in the morning, in the afternoon, we spend a little time looking at the way we are, the complexity of ourselves. And the invitation was to look through those little road markers that we went through, forgetting 14, but coming back to it at the end, um, uh, to see within those, where am I? Because we are there. Uh, While we are on our way towards uh, the uh, house of the Father, that's the way we are. And it's good to take stock of that, not to dwell excessively on it, because if we dwell excessively on our faults and our shortcomings and our failings, that borders on narcissism, and that's not good. God is so much more than we are, and loves us so passionately more than we could ever attempt in this life. And so being aware of where we are is healthy and good and sane and balanced, but it's uh, not an occasion for beating yourself up. That beating yourself up is, however, important. It helps to pay our mortgage. Um, (laughs) My wife's a therapist. (laughs) Okay, now what we want to do this morning is take a step further. I've tried to pace these Uh, as best I can with a certain kind of logic. So beginning with God, sola cum solo, then looking at ourselves in the presence of God. And then this morning in our first session, I want to look at what I'm calling the complexity of faith. Because it is complex. It's very few things that are worthwhile in this life are straightforward. Isn't that the case? They're not simple. They're fraught with ambiguity and, and indeterminacy and, and the word I'm preferring to use here, complexity. And faith isn't any different. And so now this morning, the complexity of faith. And I've put down in bold at the opening of our, of our packet a statement that I certainly often hear. I am confused, 
about what to believe as a Catholic anymore. There are so many different ideas that leave me so unsure of the church and my faith. What do I do? Whenever I hear things like that, and it's a fairly common sentiment, I think we can identify with it in some measure. In response to it, I say, think. Think. <laughs> Thinking is a good thing. You know? but when, when dogs have nothing to do, they go to sleep. When we have nothing to do, we might ask questions and think, you know, and think for ourselves. Um, one of the difficult questions that I think uh, seminarians, um, a lot of my experience over 50 years in the classroom has been with seminarians, is a certain reluctance to think for themselves. Now, let me uh, qualify that just a wee bit. Thinking for yourself does not mean being an adolescent in rebellion with everything you've been told. Thinking for yourself is the recognition that you have something between the ears and occasionally you use that something between the ears and it's good to sift through what's there in your head for yourself so that you can say when you come before our lovely God in judgment, I did the best I could with what I had. That's what I mean by thinking for yourself. Thinking for yourself does not mean thinking by yourself. A big difference there, just with that one little preposition, <laughs> for or by. Thinking for yourself means taking ownership of the precious gift that you are from God. Thinking by yourself is rather different. Thinking by yourself is, I'll determine what's real on my own. I'll determine what's true on my own. Get out of my face. Stay out of my space. I am the captain of all reality. Huh? Um, and there's a fair amount of that goes around, you know. And it's really trivial. And it's adolescent in the worst sense of the word. I love some adolescents. Um, but uh, so that there's a difference. So I'm inviting us this morning to think. And what I'm intending to do is lay before you some paradigms of how we might think and inviting us to see where we might fit into these paradigms, if at all. So it's collaboration together in thinking. And I want to open with a lovely passage that I came across from a book by the late Michael Novak, um, a book that he wrote with his daughter. If you look at the footnote, you'll see the title, Tell Me Why. Uh, Michael's daughter, uh, Jana, had kind of drifted away from things, brought up as a Catholic, uh, and uh, after college, kind of drifted away from things. And so they together, they conceived writing this book. She would write a series of questions to her dad. He was more of a philosopher than a theologian, but nobody's perfect. Um, <laughs> And then, um, from his own awareness of the faith and his own uh, contemplation, he would respond to the questions that she um, she put to him. Uh, and it's a it's a it's a very nice book. In that book, we read this passage, which I want to use as our opening um, salvo. Novak writes, "The mysteries of the movements of the human soul." fill an observer with awe. The drama of the inner life is spectacular, crowded with successive moments of dull pain, desperation, anguish, sudden hopes, shattering joys, turning points, loves, losses, doubts, wanderings. That's a pretty accurate description of the way our life goes, I think. And then he continues. <clears throat> every church, every religion 
offers a poetic ancient form by which you will be able to welcome your children into life and bury your parents. Through its local ministers, churches and rituals, the church offers you continuity across generations. This is no small thing. Humans are historical animals and the church places us within an historical tradition. Invariably, this tradition is replete with stories of heroes, crises, struggles, lessons learned at great cost. Invariably, too, this tradition offers nourishment to those whose spirits need to study as deer need water. Nice opening uh, way uh, for us to be thinking this morning. So what I want to do is um, fourfold. First of all, to look at the four stage evolution of religion, fairly abstract, but a kind of a generic way of thinking about religions um, in general. Then secondly, on page two, to consider the insights of uh, Friedrich von Hugel, whom you probably haven't heard of. And uh, thirdly, the insights of James Fowler, um, who's more contemporary. Uh, and then finally, on the last page, the way forward for ourselves in the complexity of faith. So let's get started with what I'm calling the four stage evolution of religion. And here I am reliant upon what I think are some remarkably fine insights of the lay Catholic church historian, John Dick, now retired, having taught for decades at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Over a lifetime of studying church history, John Dick comes to the conclusion that religion evolves through four basic stages. These are not meant to be, you know, very rigidly stratified stages, but if you stand back and look at the historical course of a religious of a religion's development, this appears to be what happens. And I think he's kind of on target here. The first stage is the enthusiastic and exciting and charismatic beginning. Because clearly, as Julie Andrews got it right in The Sound of Music, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. I was okay for it earlier. <laughs> So a religion comes from somewhere. Nothing comes from nothing. That's the exciting uh, beginning of the explosion that becomes a religious or a wisdom tradition. And for us, of course, that's our blessed Lord. That's Jesus with his charisma. I mean, whatever you would say about Jesus, apart from our commitment to him as Lord and God, uh, just a spectatorial observer would say, my goodness, what charisma this man had as a historical person. Look at the transformations that occurred as a result of him. That's the first stage. So the, the charismatic and loosely structured foundations of a religious tradition. And that's what we find in the New Testament. When we look at the 27 books, uh, in our canonical New Testament, you don't find a blueprint for the church as we know it today. You find the seeds of that development. Huh? Um, you find the seeds of that development, not the full-blown uh, entity that the church is today. You know, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of, of another aphorism of John Henry Newman. John Henry Newman I find very attractive, although he was English. <laughs> In his great 1845 book, an essay on the development of doctrine, which he completed before coming over into communion with um, the Catholic Church, he had a statement which I really relish. And this is an exact quotation. In heaven, it may be different. 
but here on earth to live is to change and to be perfect is to have changed often. Well, he's right. We're not inert. We're not a block of concrete. It might look like that from some time to time. We're growing human beings. Growth means change. And Newman does not mean mindless change, directionless change. But he means by change an openness to growth. And that's what we're talking about here. So that's the first stage is the original charisma of the founder. The second stage is when those immediately associated with the religious founder begin to die. And so something of that initial enthusiastic charism and the excitement engendered by it is being a little displaced. Time is happening. And so it occurs to the people of the tradition, let's get it down in code. Let's commit it to writing so that we have a reference point that connects us with the original charism of the founder. If you don't do that, you'll lose it. So if you like, the Holy Scriptures become our aid memoir our memory book that helps us to connect with the person and the events that we were not around to witness. So that's the second stage, still pretty fluid. You know, if you look through the various authors of the New Testament, they're all in love with the Lord. They all recognize the salvation he has brought, but they codify it a wee bit differently because they write in different circumstances. Matthew writing in a very predominantly Jewish context, probably in the Syrian city of Antioch, has a sort of Jewish penumbra that uh, flows over the 28 chapters of his gospel. Luke is different, but they're all focused on Jesus. So they're trying to codify something of the original excitement and enthusiasm of the Lord. Then, according to John Dick, stage three is where we kind of settle down and develop what he calls a barrel vision. What does he mean by this? I, I think he means that, yes, we're connected to the Lord. Yes, we're connected to the Lord through the codification that is the New Testament and then the beginning of the tradition. But then we, because of our commitment, and not for any malevolent reason, we tend to screen out other possibilities. But because of our, our love for our tradition and everything that it contains and all the benefits that accrue from it, we kind of um, blind ourselves uh, to other possibilities where God's Holy Spirit is at work. I mean, we can say for certain in our faith that God's Spirit is at work here in the church. Yes? yes, yes. But who could say where God's Holy Spirit is not at work? Except, obviously, in the case of sin and evil. Huh? You, you can't confine God. That would be blasphemy. That would be um, heresy, and you ought to be burned uh, to a crisp for your own good. <laughs> so this is this is where um, this is where the barrel vision uh, comes in. You can't avoid it, uh, and it, but when it takes over in in too straight jacketed a form, it can become destructive. You know? It can disempower the individual. And that disempowerment makes our rigidity even more rigid. Look at the last statement in stage three in that little paragraph, or the second uh, last statement. There is a growing emphasis. Do you see where I am? Mm -hmm. There is a growing emphasis on doctrinal fidelity, or what is taken to mean orthodoxy, and obedience to authority. 
faith becomes more a matter of believing certain things than of living in a particular way, the way and spirit of the founder. If you look at the history of the church, that's what happened. Uh, how would one verify that? Because we broke the church. We broke the church in the 11th century. When I say we, I mean human beings. Uh, we broke the church in the 11th century with the parting of the ways between East and West. Uh, and, and we're still apart, even after uh, 50 plus years of ecumenical commitment since the Second Vatican Council. I'm amazed at how, how far we have come in some ways and how very little we have come in other ways. I, this morning before coming out, I came across a statement by a, a Russian Orthodox um, prelate saying that the, um, the patriarch, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew I of Constantinople, who's a kind of honorary patriarch of all the Orthodox churches, he wants to become a pope. What do you mean by that? Well, somebody who can tell you what to do and can uh, adjudicate in a kind of a legalistic way over the entirety of your life. Well, that's not the papacy. Uh, that's not. That's a figment in the um, imagination of that Russian prelate. But nothing comes from nothing. And in some ways, that figment is based on some pretty rigid ways we have been in our lives. So we broke the church in the 11th century and we broke it again in the 16th century. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is this, that when we broke the church, we began to understand the meaning of the faith against them. In the 11th century, all the errors of the orthodox we have the fullness of the truth in the 16th century all the errors of those reformation christians those protestants who went away from us yeah, there that's not the truth as pope st john paul ii acknowledged in his encyclical on ecumenism in the early 1980s eh, sorry early 1990s that they may be one. People on both sides were responsible for this breaking of the church, not just one side. Um, I, I grew up certainly with the idea, well, he didn't do anything wrong as Catholics. It was those big baddie Protestants. And I sometimes tell uh, the students about an exhilarating and yet deflating experience I had as a seven-year-old. Um, at 73, I'm allowed to be garrulous. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have, uh, brought up in a downtown parish in Glasgow in the west of Scotland. And every Lent, we would have a parish mission. It was a parish that was conducted uh, by the Passionist Fathers, and they always had a Passionist who came then to do the Lenten Parish Mission. And traditionally in those days, there would be a couple of evenings for the women, a couple of evenings for the men, and then there would be a morning towards the end of the week for the, the children who had been in school during the week. So I'm there in St. Mungo's Parish Church in 1955. And the priest was fired up. <laughs> They didn't, they didn't preach from the pulpit. They preached from a platform that was situated on the first half a dozen pews, you know. So the, they were in your face, so to speak. You know, you couldn't miss them. And they had a, a very pronounced religious habit here. You were focused, right? So this priest fired us up and he said, I don't recall his name. You children must go out and win somebody over for Christ in the Catholic Church. Oh, I was thrilled by the prospect of this, you know. Glasgow was not a predominantly Catholic city. We lived, um, we were dirt poor, we lived on the top floor of a 150-year-old tenement. 
and there were five other families on this floor, including Mrs. Match. I went home after the mission, and I knocked on Mrs. Match's door. She came to the door. Hi, Owen. Would you like to become a Catholic, Mrs. Much? She said, no. <laughs> Close the door. <laughs> my enthusiasm and my deflation <laughs> within an hour, you know. The, the, what was operative in my mind as a child, and which I have taken a long time to unlearn, is this um, doing theology against someone else. You know, the goodies, the baddies. Huh? Um, we stopped doing that as a church. We're much more open and receptive to the understanding that the other has of herself rather than in an a priori fashion how I think she understands herself. And so that's one of the consequences of this third stage. John Dick then says it's a stage four and this is how he describes it. You have it in front of you. This is Reformation. He doesn't mean Reformation in the sense of the 16th century splitting up. But he means by reforming, huh? uh, repristinating ourselves in, a, in that sense, um, attaching ourselves once more to the enthusiastic, liberating vision of the founder. And so he describes it in this fashion moving away from what might be termed rigid believing to a freer, more joy-filled religious living. Not abandonment of doctrine, belief, ritual, so much as a recognition that the primary goal is communion with God. And I think that's kind of where we are today. I'll come back to this in our last session on Friday morning. So the, the sort of thinking for ourselves that I'm trying to uh, inculcate is not abandoning what the church teaches, not abandoning our beliefs, our doctrines, our rituals, our patterns of prayer, and so on and so forth, as recognizing that they are means to an end and not ends in themselves. When I say means to an end, everything about the church, everything about the church is meant to be a kind of an apparatus that enables us to become sola cum sola. Yeah. That's what it's about. But you can get fixated, especially if you love the church, as we do here. You can get fixated on almost seeing the means to the end as somehow objectively the ends in themselves. Maybe 15 years ago, another story. Just tell me to shut up and I will. Ariel does it, <laughs> effectively, ex opere operato. About 15 years ago, I had a student in class and it was a first year class on revelation and faith, fundamental theology. And he'd come into the church uh, from another Christian tradition. And uh, he's become a very fine priest. So I'm working my way through with the class the Second Vatican Council's document on Revelation. And very clear the to, in the beginning of that document, we find a statement that asserts that God reveals himself to everyone that God reveals himself in some kind of mysterious fashion to everyone. Well, if God loves everyone, if he desires everyone to be, it kind of follows almost automatically that he makes himself known, perhaps in a shadowy way, but to everyone. The student's hand went up. I can't accept that. So let's call him... Let's not call him Beelzebub. <laughs> Let's call him Beelzebul, a variant in the Synoptic Gospels. I said, well, Beelzebul, it's not Owen that's uh, opinionated here. It's the church. I'm articulating what I can't accept it. I said to him, 
Well, the bull. What would it take for you to accept that what I'm saying is true? A very thoughtful young man remains so as a priest. He said, if the diocesan censor said it, I would believe it. I said, you're looking at him. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I was the censor under John Glasney for a <laughs> so, bit of fun. But what, what was happening here is he was seeing his preconceived, rather rigid understanding of the church and its tradition, not as the means to communion with God, but almost as that itself. And the church, of course, doesn't look at it this way. So that's the kind of overall view that John Dick offers us. Let's turn to page two. How can we get through this kind of transitional period in which we now find ourselves. And I want to turn to the insights of two thinkers who have helped me. The first one is a wonderful man, Friedrich von Hugel, um, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, he, he, was, uh, he had a Scottish mother and a German father, an Austrian father. So he was, he was the product of two worlds. Von Hugel thinks that there are three necessary stages to being a Catholic. Uh, he, he would say these stages would obtain across the Christian tradition, not just to Catholicism, but it certainly is the case for Catholics. And he called each of these stages the institutional stage, the intellectual stage, and the mystical stage. And in his view, they were necessary stages through which you have to pass. You can't sort of choose one and say, well, this appeals to me, I'm going to go for that. Um, it's necessary, in his opinion, at least to pass through the first two. The institutional stage of the faith is where you pick it up from other people, from the institution, from the institution of your parents, uh, from the institution of your pastors and other significant adults in your early life as a, as a person, as a young person. You're told what to think. You're told how to behave you're told how to conduct yourself. Isn't that the case? That's the way it gets into our, into our heads. We're not born with a set of innate ideas and beliefs and practices. You pick them up from the institutions that nurture you. Uh, uh, I can remember my grandmother. One of the things with which I am cursed is, uh, is a very retentive memory and uh, at two years old, I can remember my grandmother, Nana Cummings, who was a very devout and wonderful woman, telling me the names of the 12 apostles. She would repeat this, you know, constantly. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip. Okay, I can still do it. Thank you, Nana. <laughs> but that's what happens, isn't it? I'm taught what to do. Don't put your hands on the stove. This is where, well, I can't say it now, but I'm too set in my ways. You put your fork in your left hand and your knife in your right hand. I know that's not how we do it in the colonies, but that's the way I was taught. <laughs> you, everything that you have that marks you as a person comes to you from outside. That's what Mon Hugo says, right? The second stage then is what he calls the intellectual stage. And this is where the person starts to ask questions. Um, I think it starts earlier now in our educational systems than it did when I was a child. When I was a child, and in fact, most of the way through high school, I was just in love with the whole enterprise of being a Catholic. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And, and the onset of, um, of the intellectual stage, I think, was later. 
in, in my case and in my generation, it's earlier now, where you start to ask questions like, why? Why, why should I? How do I know that's right? These are good things. It's the, the intellect is starting to develop in the young person, and so it's natural for them to bring forth a, a host of questions about the things that are most important to them, right? And that's the case with the faith. And shut up is not an appropriate response, you know? Uh, what we need to do is to be honest and appreciative of what they're saying, and try to lead them further and deeper into an appreciation of the faith. If you try to stop that process, you do enormous destruction to your relationship with your children and to their possible growth in the faith. And then the third stage, according to von Hugel, is where you know, you, you've come through the institutional, it's part of you, you don't leave it behind. You've come through the intellectual and it remains part of you, you don't leave it behind. You do continue to ask questions and to think, but here's the deal. At the mystical stage, you recognize it's all about God. It's all about God. And it's all about God inviting me into communion with himself. And that's the high point of the development of the person. Now, says von Hugel, while the first and second stages are to some extent inevitable, in part of the simple, the, the, the psychosocial process of development, the third stage isn't. And impediments can get in the way. Impediments of all kinds, like, you know, parents who refuse to be open to their children and to listen um, appropriately, or perhaps a rather irate or rigid pastor, my way of the highway kind of guy from other seminaries, not from here. Um, you know, that, that kind, they get in the way. Or, or someone gets into marital difficulties and they go to see their pastor and he just sort of wipes the floor with them. This, ha this has happened in the past. I, one of my aunties, uh, after a very short marriage, um, her husband was playing the field and they were divorced within about two years of having been married. She came back to Glasgow to her mother's home and because we were all devout Catholics, she went to see the pastor. He said to her, you can never go to communion again. Well, she didn't. And on the day I buried my own mother, her sister was there and didn't come to communion because she had been told. And she had no great love for the faith, you know, as a result of that. That's what I mean by things getting in the way. I'm not just finding fault with pastors. We all put impediments in the way of others, you know. Stuff happens. Okay, that's the first set of insights coming from Friedrich von Hugel. The second set of insights I found helpful come from uh, someone who is more contemporary, James Fowler. And he tries to take that kind of developmental paradigm and parse it in a little more detail. Now, the details are not really important. I'm gonna fly through this, but just what, what do I want to be the takeaway? Somewhere I'm found here. That's the takeaway. Try, try to identify where you are, if you will legitimate his paradigm for a little bit. So according to Fowler, and of course he is heir to all the side the psychological developments of the 20th century, the pre-stage to faith is infancy. Now, an infant doesn't think. An infant feeds and poops. Huh? Um, but if an infant doesn't receive in those earliest stages of development human warmth being held, we, we know this, it's, it's uh, 
everybody knows this stuff these days it's commonplace then the basic foundations for trust and faith in life are already missing in some measure or degree and need to be compensated for later on so there's a pre-stage not reflective there's no thinking going on but we're not just brains on sticks <laughs> we're we're emotive beings we absorb reality through the emotions uh, perhaps sometimes more so than through the intellect after the pre-stage james fowler says there's what he calls an intuitive projective faith you might wonder how did he arrive at this paradigm by interviewing people over a period of 30 years careful questionnaire interviewing people not just fill in the blanks kind of thing but listening to them and transcribing their responses and from doing that with literally thousands of um, of christians that's how he arrived at this paradigm so the first um, stage in the paradigm for fowler is what he calls intuitive projective faith early childhood around once they start to speak and talk and walk and, and uh, all the rest of it from about two to six or seven and what the child does is she intuits what her parents or other significant adults are saying and doing in life and projects them herself yeah. it's very imitative yeah. so what's good there in the parental environment is imitated and unfortunately what's not so good there in the parental environment is imitated there's no avoiding it it's the way you get things huh? that's the way you get stuff and that yields to stage two beginning perhaps around seven and maybe going to around age ten these are not fixed in in um, in, in steel um, the, the the young person begins to pick up the faith by learning the stories of the faith huh? the stories of the scriptures um, uh, hear them in church um, and pick them up just from um, uh, uh, the environment the, the, the stories that you find in the Bible the stories of the saints especially the stories about our blessed Lord they pick them up right but they understand them literally and most children of this stage what do they love to do? tell me a story huh? but I think they're beginning to discern beginning to discern a difference between a kind of fictional story that is less real than a story that is real you know uh, some of my grandchildren will say to me when they when they come over tell us a story granddad once upon no a story from your own life <laughs> now what's going on when they say that they're beginning to discriminate aren't they you know from a, a story like um trying to think of the stories we told children you know what I'm talking about the fairy tales and so on no but there they, they can see there's a difference between that which is real enough for them but what's what what tell me about something that happened to you and so there's something's going on there maybe the reflective ability is starting to kick in eh? now that should move on to what um, Fowler calls synthetic conventional faith and this is where young person reaches adolescence and basically they they know what it means to be a Catholic uh, whether they're attending a Catholic school or CCD or whatever it happens to be they know what's expected right they know the package um, the, the seven sacraments the Ten Commandments um, the, the, the books of the Bible and, and so on and so forth the, 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 it's a stage of greater absorption of the tradition but not necessarily marked by any great uh, intellectually reflexive awareness yet there are some questions yes there is some discrimination and discernment going on but it's not at its peak yeah. very often a youngster in the early stage uh, the early years of stage three when they rebel against structure or handed down beliefs and so on they're really asking for more 
structure. <laughs> you know, they, they, they can't exist. None of us can exist without structure. It's destabilizing. And so when they rebel against it, it's a kind of a, a, a different way, and an inverse way of saying, make sure I'm structured and, and so on. Stage four is um, where they begin to think more clearly for themselves, what he calls individuative reflective faith. Okay, so I'm in my late teens, and you've told me this, but I'm not sure it's true. You've told me that, but uh, my experience is telling me that may not be the case. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about. Here, thinking for yourself is beginning to kick in in uh, big time. Um, and this is often the point at which uh, young people will say, um, I'm going to go my own way. You know, because they're figuring it out. They're, they're sifting through everything they have absorbed in these earlier stages of development. But now from the fulcrum of, I'm going to make sense of this for myself, you know, there's a kind of a, almost a, uh, an intellectual self-righteousness taking over at this stage. If you're lucky, uh, says uh, Fowler, you get to stage five, which he calls conjunctive faith. What's a conjunction in, in English grammar? Yes. Something that joins two parts of a sentence, right? Um, Conjunctive faith is a stage in life where you're appreciative of everything that has been handed on to you, beliefs, doctrines, customs, moral ideals, rules, regulations, etc., etc. But you're critical. You've come through that sort of think-for-yourself um, phase where you are the captain of your own ship. But you can hold both of these values together, conjunctively, accepting and being receptive to the tradition, and at the same time, you know, being able to um, retain a certain kind of critical distance. You can hold them together. It means that there's a certain tension. There's a certain tension. But the maturing person can live with tension. Tension doesn't mean the sky is falling. It just means get on with it, you know. Um, so that's the conjunctive faith. And that, that can happen as early as midlife, but it might never happen. But what do I mean it might never happen? I certainly have known parishioners uh, in real difficulty because somehow elements of their experience and their own individual reflection are telling them one thing, but you know, Nana told me that, and my mom and dad told me this, and father said that, and I can't stand the tension, so I'm just going to stay the way we were. I'm going to rest on the way I was. I'm going to screen out from my life as best I can, this intellectual element of questing for myself. That happens to people. It often leads to great unhappiness. I mean, because you can't go back to the way we were. You can think about it and remember it, but you can't go back because once, once your intellect starts to develop, you can't sort of um, press the delete button on that operation and cease to think, you know. So the, the value is to, is to be a both and person, which is very typical of Catholicism, both receptive and critical. And then, uh, according to Fowler, there's universalizing faith, and he thinks this is very rare. And what he means by this is that where a person reaches a point, yeah, Catholicism means everything to me. My faith means everything to me, both receptively and critically. I can live with the tension generated by these two poles. 
And I also acknowledge that Islam means that to a committed Muslim, and Buddhism means that to a committed Buddhist. And I'm not just lazily tolerant of other points of view, I'm also aware that God is operative ways beyond my ken in these other wisdom traditions, these other great religious traditions of the world, um, and indeed in people who don't have any particular religious tradition. I'm not going to fence God in, and I can live with that. Uh, I can live without having a formula like, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm God's chosen, and by the way, you're not. Huh? That's the sort of stage that he calls universalizing. And probably we're all a mixture of these. You know, it's not, okay, I'm through stage two, I'm ready for stage three, let's get uh, fired up and get going. It isn't like that. You know, it's, it's more undulating. But um, here's perhaps the, the immediate takeaway. Age and stage do not necessarily correlate. You can grow up and be infantile in your appreciation of the faith. Or you could grow up and not be open to God's spirit moving you through the psychosocial, psychosocial stages of development uh, in an appreciation of your faith. And that can, that can get you into all kinds of conflicts about the faith, you know, between one generation and the next, you know, the, the next upcoming generation. Uh, it doesn't have to be the case, but it can happen. Let's move over. Where do we go from here? Well, what do you do? You can't avoid these tensions and so on, but what can you do to ameliorate uh, your own personal movement in faith? So I, I have um, three recommendations. Um, so continue to study and find out about your faith. That's uh, maybe the most obvious recommendation. Don't think you know it all. Nobody does. Nobody knows it all. Continue to think, study as appropriately, and find out about your faith. What you think is the faith may not, in fact, be the faith. It's what you thought was the case from the time you were a small child, but you haven't grown up. You know, but put it in more, um, uh, rather different secular terms. Maybe growing up, you saw yourself as a Republican or a Democrat, because that's what your mom and dad were. But maybe as you matured through life, you began to realize, you know, well, there are pluses and minuses on both sides, and, you know, um, I'm going to run for president myself now. You know, uh, you know. Do you know what I'm saying? You, you, you don't just stay stuck, you know, and you don't stay stuck because you're thinking and continuing to think and reflect, and and you can live with the tensions that are possibly generated uh, within these various stages of development. But for us, as uh, as Catholics, and for you as Oblates, I think there's a little more at stake here. I found it very finely put by the theologian Nicholas Lash, whom I cited yesterday afternoon. He writes there, to be quite blunt, can you see where I am? <laughs> this is very hard. To be quite blunt, those who refuse to do theology, to read, think hard, discuss, simply do not in fact care about the truth of Christianity, or at the very least, do not care sufficiently to seek some understanding of that word through whom all things are made, into whose light we have been called, and which will set us free. Whoa. So if I don't read a little, think hard, discuss, Basically, I don't care about the faith. I think he's right. It's very harshly put, but maybe that's not a bad thing. So continuing to read, study, think hard, discuss. And not just through theology books, 
through novels and literature. How many people like movies? Quite a number. And I'm already addicted to thrillers. But you know, what I find is, um, well, there's the, the thrill of the story. I'm going to I'm try to guess who done it. You know? I usually don't manage that. But what I find is, as I'm drawn into the narrative and into the development of the characters in the narrative, you know, you're thinking, oh, that was a mistake. He shouldn't have done that. She's overreacting to the pain of the immediate situation. Those are the sorts of thoughts you have when you're watching a good movie or, um, or reading a, a good novel. That's why I'm recommending um, novels and literature. Um, they can tell us a great deal about life and therefore about God. And then the last recommendation I have is this. Never fight about the faith. I have never come across a situation where fighting about the faith was ever successful. It becomes what I call ping-pong theology. I say this and you say that and the ball goes back and forth across the ping-pong table. Who gives a hoot about that? When you open yourself genuinely, and this is really hard, I'm not a good listener. Uh, she who must be obeyed keeps telling me this. And unfortunately, she's right, though I'll never admit it to her. Um, listening receptively to another. Sometimes the scales fall from your eyes or your ears and you're beginning to hear and see things that maybe you hadn't been open to before and it changes people. What I would call an advocacy of an apologetics of love rather than ping-pong apologetics. And unfortunately, I think ping-pong apologetics is too often the mode in which popular apologists work, you know? And there it is. So let's use as our ending this beautiful passage from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, because this puts it all in perspective. Let's recite it together. It's the italicized passage at the bottom of page three. So together, with all lowliness and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God has forgiven you. Can't better that. Do we have time for some conversation, Ariel? You're the boss of us. <laughs> right, so there we have time. Please. If I can make a comment on your stage right here. Tell, tell me where you are now. Um, the fourth stage evolution of, of religion. And okay. Mm -hmm. um, kind of um, I'm Eastern Catholic, Ukrainian Catholic. My parents came over from Ukraine. And for 14 years, all I knew was being a Ukrainian Catholic. We went to a Roman Catholic school, and then it was like, what are the kids doing? They're blessing themselves. The wrong way. <laughs> They're blessing themselves the wrong way. They're receiving communion. How? So for, you know, that period of adolescent care, they kind of want to blend in. They kind of blend in to, in, into the, the Roman Catholic um, scene. Then um, I married and uh, my children were raised Ukrainian Catholic, but 
uh, I was also married to a Lutheran for 15 years, and um, it started me questioning Catholicism just generally. And then, um, it didn't work out very well, but um, the last two years, well, then I went back into my same Catholic church, but the last two years, I have been privileged to experience the Roman Catholic faith in a much more deep and a mature way than I did as a, as a teenager in high school. And um, I spoke with both pastors, and I said, I, my training Catholic church was just offering services once a week, and I needed, I needed to be in the presence of God more often. And the two pastors were so understanding and so helpful. I felt I was being held with each hand on each side from the east and the west and being led closer to God. And, um, but in my socializing with Roman Catholics, a lot of them don't even know that Eastern Catholics <laughs> exist. And they put us in the Orthodox. And, and it just really hurt me when I said, I'm Catholic, but I'm not Roman Catholic. Well, you must be Orthodox. And so many people put that barrel, I, I don't know, that's why this thing re really hit me, because I've experienced it in so many different ways from people that I don't think mean to be mean, but they just kind of, this, this is what I think of Catholic, and if you're not this, then you're not Catholic. And. Um, I don't know, I, I, I have been blessed and graced, like I said, to read Catholicism from both lungs, and it has led me to a much closer presence of God. What a beautiful narrative. <laughs> Thank you for that. You. Um, and may I say, and I don't mean this in any condescension, you're very fortunate, you're very blessed, because not everyone in such a difficult situation in life comes through in in such a successful way those aren't the right words but you know exactly what i mean i if anything i i think that most people uh have life hard I don't always reveal all the elements of that to you, but I think that's true. Most people are carrying the cross in one way or another. Life is hard. And when life is hard, it's not easy to be upbeat and to develop a spirituality of positive response to the moment. Um, it's easier, in a sense, to be complacent with the way things are, with what I know, with what I understand. That's the stage three kind of thing, you know, um, in Fowler's analysis. I, I, oh, I don't want to be bothered with that. Don't tell me about Ukrainian Catholics. You're either Roman or you're not, and you're going to perdition, you know. Um, uh, it takes a struggle, and I would say a lifelong struggle, to get out of that stage three complacency because I'm afraid. And I'm building, and this has been my experience of working with people. When you've been hurt by life in whatever level, relational, intellectual, whatever, moral, we all have this tendency to build a carapace around ourselves, a kind of a shell, so that I can't get hurt anymore, right? But that's, that, that's trivializing this wonderful life we have. So I, taking off the shell is as difficult as all God out. That's the Paschal mystery. Uh, it's taking off the shell and recognizing, geez, I don't know it all after all. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's more to learn and there's more to appreciate and so on. Can you imagine if as a race we did that, it would mean the cessation of war, 
It would mean the cessation of violence, the cessation of all the tribalisms that characterize us. Um, it would be heaven on earth. You know? um, but we're still on earth, and so it's a struggle. And your beautiful autobiographical story brings us great hope. Thank you for it. I'm almost finished this caffeine. Okay, Tim. Uh. <laughs> I guess one of my observations that I see is that people have a tendency, at least in my thinking, to confuse and to merge faith and religion as the same thing. And to me, faith and religion are parts of the same puzzle, but there are differences because just because you're not in my religion, doesn't mean you don't have faith. That's right. But there are enough people that think, well, if you're not, then you don't have the right faith. Be beautifully put. There is a distinction to be made between faith and religion. If I could put it somewhat bluntly, religion is intended to intensify and deepen your faith. But it can sometimes become an end in itself. Huh? And you used some really nice words at the beginning of your, your statement. I can't remember them exactly. Uh, but you, you qualified uh, what you were saying by, uh, with the words uh, something like, well, this is what I think. Uh, you know, that was wonderful. If we could all sort of say, well, this is what I think. But I'm still alive and I could think more, <laughs> you know. By implication, that's what you're saying. Beautiful statement. I would say that no one is without faith. Uh, yesterday, when we were conversing, I said that every person desires God. God is desired by every human heart, even if not named as such. I mean, people don't go around saying, hey, I desire God, do you? Well, some people do, but <laughs> they're wing nuts, you know? <laughs> um, um, everyone, in virtue of being human, desires God. There's something they're searching for that will bring that kind of joyful, peaceful, tranquil satisfaction to the human heart. Huh? That's faith at work. Uh, and I think religious faith, in its Catholic sense, East and Western ones, is an attempt to say, this is how it could be. This is how it could be if you regulate your innate desire in a particular way, and it works. You know? but. As we say that, we're still sort of stuck somewhere in this, these paradigms, if you will allow a certain legitimacy to them. And, and the issue is to keep going, to keep going. You know, I, uh, Last year, during the pandemic, can, can, can we just go for another minute or two? Um, my oldest grandson was due to be confirmed. And uh, he's an intelligent kid. He's... Uh, one of these computer whizzes, you know, um, the school district pays him to work on their computers. You know? um, so um, uh, he asked me if I would prepare him for confirmation um, because uh, coming together was pretty restricted in terms of confirmation classes. So I said, okay. And uh, so he, we used to meet every two weeks for a couple of hours, he'd have dinner with Kathy and me, and then um, we were reading Novak's book together, um, because uh, it was maybe a little bit beyond him. He was 16 at the time, but he was uh, he was sharp enough to get it. Well, you know, um, I think it was good for both of us, because um, his mom is a Polish Catholic. Um, his dad, unfortunately, is my wife's son. Um, uh, and so they each come with their own baggage. And we all have it, right? And I could hear him as we conversed together, sifting through some things for himself. 
And that gave me a lot of joy. And I think it gave him a certain kind of emancipation. Um, uh, that's the way to be. The way St. Paul describes it in that passage from Ephesians. I wish I was like that, but I'm not. I'm just a screwed up Irish Catholic, <laughs> stranded on the shores of the colonies, <laughs> married to an American woman, which was a mistake. <laughs> mistake because I met her in graduate school at Trinity College, Dublin, and I heard she was from Miami, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> close the books, kid. Cultivate this woman. Uh, T. Martunis by the poolside every day. No financial worries. Everything is sorted out, and I got it wrong. <laughs> but we're still working at it. Time for a break.